Francis Bacon's Hamlet, a Tudor family tragedy. This video is dedicated to Sir Edwin Durning Lawrence for his magnificent contribution to Baconian scholarship and for his donation of one of the best book collections in the world on Sir Francis Bacon and Shakespeare, housed at the Senate House Library at the University of London. The tragical history of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, is the most problematic of all the Shakespeare plays and problems and questions still continue to vex orthodox editors, scholars and critics more than four centuries after its publication. Its central character, the royal Prince Hamlet, is universally regarded as the most complex character in all world literature. The whole essence of his being completely engages and absorbs us emotionally, psychologically and intellectually. The full gamut of human complexity resides within him. His vast philosophical mind provides him with a deep knowledge and understanding of the human condition. His troubled soul is filled with passion and contradictions as he explores the profound depth of his grief. He is possessed with the ability to turn his searching mind inwards to look within himself and outward at the nature of humankind, its virtues and defects and its goodness and evil. An acceptance of life is the central theme in a play which is an all-encompassing meditation upon life and death. When we are able to comprehend Hamlet, we will be in a better position to understand, understand ourselves. And when we are fully able to comprehend the play Hamlet, we will be better able to understand the elusive mysteries of the human condition and human existence, as well as the elusive secrets and mysteries of human life and death. The tragedy, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, shadows the most explosive and sensational secrets of the Elizabethan reign, in which a not-so-virgin Queen Elizabeth was secretly married to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, with whom she had two concealed royal princes, Francis Tudor Bacon and Robert Tudor Devereux. It tells the tale of its author, a disinherited royal prince, Francis Tudor Bacon, in the shape of Hamlet, who is denied his rightful kingship by his mother, Queen Elizabeth, and the exhaustion and death of the royal Tudor dynasty. Behind its dramatis personae lies the leading figures of the Elizabethan period. Francis Bacon Tudor, concealed Prince of Wales, Prince Hamlet, Queen Elizabeth Tudor, Queen Gertrude, and her secret husband, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, King Claudius, Robert Tudor Devereux, Earl of Essex, Laertes, Sir Nicholas Bacon, the ghost of Old Hamlet, and Sir William Cecil, Polonius. It is a story of a lustful Queen Elizabeth and the notorious poisoner and murderer, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, and the strange death, possibly through poisoning by Leicester, of Sir Nicholas Bacon. It is a play all about revenge, murder and death, through the poisonings of the old Hamlet, King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Laertes and Hamlet himself, and by other means, the deaths of Polonius, Ophelia and the two state spies, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. The first issue we are faced with is when precisely Hamlet was written, a problematic question which has also eluded Shakespeare editors, scholars and commentators for more than 400 years. One that has given rise to seemingly endless debate and discussion, with virtually all orthodox scholars now currently of the view that it is not likely to ever be satisfactorily resolved. The drama was first entered on the Stationers' Register on the 26th of July 1602 as a book called The Revenge of Hamlet, Prince Denmark, as it was lately acted by the Lord Chamberlain, his servants. The first quarter edition of the play appeared in 1603 entitled The Tragical History of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark by William Shakespeare, as it hath been diverse times acted by his Highness servants in the City of London, as also in the two universities of Cambridge and Oxford and elsewhere, with a text of around 2,200 lines. A second quarto followed shortly after in 1604 with a different title page as the Tragical History of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare, newly imprinted and enlarged 
God to almost as much again as it, it was, according to the true and perfect copy, containing approximately 3,800 lines. These are the simple, undisputed bibliographical facts, but to determine when the play was actually written, it is necessary to work chronologically backwards. Not just some of the way, providing only part of the picture, the fraudulent modus operandi of orthodox scholarship, but all the way, providing the reader with all the evidence and information to enable them to see the full picture, which Stratfordian scholarship has been concealing from the rest of the world to the present day. The date modern editors of Hamlet have generally settled upon for the date the play was written is around 1600. This is the date given in the Oxford Shakespeare The Complete Works by its editors Professor Stanley Wells, Honorary President of the Shakespeare Birth Birthplace Trust, seen as the foremost living expert on Shakespeare, and Professor Gary Taylor, Fellow of the Folger Shakespeare Library. It is our belief that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet about 1600. It was a view shared by Professor Bate, a Fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Literature, knighted in 2015, and Professor Eric Rasmussen, the editors of the Royal Shakespeare Company edition of William Shakespeare's Complete Works. Date, 1600. The Arden editor of Hamlet, Professor Harold Jenkins, one of the foremost Shakespeare scholars of his century, was of the bind. The conclusion I am brought to concerning the date of Hamlet is that as it has come down to us, it belongs to 1601. In the Oxford edition of Hamlet, Professor Hibbard hovers around the date 1600 to 1601, and a possible date of mid-1601 is posited by Professor Philip Edwards in the Cambridge edition of the play. In his still standard eight-volume Narrative and Dramatic Sources of Shakespeare, Professor Bullough opts for a wider range of dates. I believe the play was mainly written between 1598 and 1601, and that alterations were made probably in 1601 or 1602. As does Professor John Dover Wilson, who states in his edition of Hamlet that Shakespeare, Shakespeare may first have handled the play in 1596 and then revised in 1601. In 1596 is when Thomas Lodge referred to Hamlet in his Wit's Misery and the World's Madness, which according to most Orthodox scholars was a play named Hamlet, but written by someone else. He walks for the most part in black under colour of gravity, and looks as pale as the vizard of ye ghost which cried so miserably at ye theatre, like an oyster wife, Hamlet, revenge! There is a reference to a performance of a play named Hamlet at Newton Butts on 9th of June 1594 in Henslow's Diary. It is listed along with two other Shakespeare plays, Titus Andronicus and The Taming of a Shrew. Fifth of June, 1594, Titus Andronicus. 9th of June, 1594, Hamlet. 11th of June 1594, The Taming of a Shrew, 12th of June 1594, Titus Andronicus. That there was certainly a Hamlet on the stage in 1589 is confirmed by Thomas Nash in a curious and enigmatic address to the gentlemen students of both universities, prefixed to Robert Greene's prose romance Menaphon, 1589. English Seneca, read by candlelight, yields many good sentences, as blood is a beggar, and so forth. And if you entreat him fair in a frosty morning, he will afford you whole hamlets, I should say handfuls of tragical speeches. The majority of modern Shakespeare scholars believe this hamlet refers to an earlier play, the so-called Ur-Hamlet, no longer extant. 
many of whom wrongly believe was written by Thomas Kidd. Conversely, several other Shakespeare scholars have taken a different view. In Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, Professor Bloom writes, The origins of Shakespeare's most famous play are as shrouded as Hamlet's textual condition is confused. There is an earlier Hamlet that Shakespeare's drama revises Nova Goes, but we do not have this trial work, nor do we know who composed it. Most scholars believe that its author was Thomas Kidd, who wrote the archetypal revenge play The Spanish Tragedy. I think, though, that Peter Alexander was correct in his surmise that Shakespeare himself wrote the Ur Hamlet no later than 1589, when he was first starting as a dramatist. It was a young Shakespeare who wrote this 1589 play called Hamlet, writes Sams, for which he provides a long list of grounds, among them this following observation. Economy of reasoning, also known as Occam's Razor, and common sense say that the same revising author wrote and rewrote all the various versions of Hamlet, as of any other multiple text play, for example King Lear. The joint modern Arden editors of Hamlet, Professors Anne Thompson and Neil Taylor, not only express the view that Shakespeare's Hamlet may date back as far as 1589, but may have been written even before that date. The argument that Hamlet alludes to Julius Caesar, while attractive, remains unproven. Once this is conceded, and once it is further conceded that we are not looking for just one precise date, but a process of production which involves drafts of manuscripts, performances in different venues, and the publication of a number of different texts, then it becomes possible to admit that a version of Hamlet by Shakespeare may date back to 1589 or even earlier. With one eye on the authorship issue, modern orthodox scholars do not dare venture a date further back than the second half of the 1580s, simply because William Shakespeare was still residing in or had scarcely left Stratford. Stratfordians put his departure at between 1585 and 1587, for which there is no evidence whatsoever, in order to ma maintain their fictitious narratives that he was the author of the Shakespeare works, including the greatest of them all, Hamlet. Before Shakespeare, according to orthodox Shakespeare scholars, had supposedly left Stratford in 1585, the original version of the Shakespeare play, the so-called Ur Hamlet, had already been written and apparently performed at Oxford University by the Earl of Leicester's men, named after its patron Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. The Earl of Leicester's men were most probably the first acting company to perform the Shakespeare play Hamlet. The first quarter edition of Hamlet states on its title page, It hath been diverse times acted by his highness servant in the City of London, as also in the two universities of Cambridge and Oxford and elsewhere, which it appears stretched back two decades to its forerunner, the Earl of Leicester's men. In On Renaissance Drama or History Made Visible, Thompson indicates that Hamlet had been acted at Oxford University in 1585. It is, he writes, a matter of inference from allusions to it by a contemporary writer. In the spring of 1585, the Earl of Leicester, as Chancellor of Oxford University, put on a series of royal entertainments for Queen Elizabeth. During this gala season of Oxford, characteristic of Leicester and his time in any affair of regal compliment or festivity, the Corpus Christi and All Souls Colleges were from day to day the theatre of fate savants, during one of which Hamlet was performed by the Chancellor's players. The acting company attended Leicester in his expedition to aid the States General in the Netherlands. He was formally appointed to the command of the English troops in August 1585, 
with Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, made General of the Horse, with the English forces reaching Flushing on the 10th of December. The Earl of Leicester's progress through Utrecht, Leyden and The Hague was noted for the lavish pageants given in his, given in his honour. After serving in the Earl of Leicester's men, three of its players, the clown Will Kemp, George Bryan and Thomas Pope, are recorded as performing at the Danish court. According to the orthodox German Shakespeare scholar George Bruns, in the year 1585, a troop of English players had appeared in the courtyard of the town hall of Elsinore. If we are justified in assuming this troop to have been the same which we find in the following year established at the Danish court, it numbered among, uh, among its members three persons who, at the time when Shakespeare was turning over in his mind the idea of Hamlet, belonged to his company of actors, and probably to his most intimate circle, namely William Kemp, George Bryan and Thomas Pope. It also appears from a series of letters and other information printed by Albert Cohn in Shakespeare in Germany in the 16th and 17th centuries that a group of English actors who had been sent by Leicester to the King of Denmark had also gone to Germany as early as 1586. It was around this time that some Shakespeare scholars believe the tragedy of fatricide punished or Prince Hamlet of Denmark was written, a German derivative of an early version of Hamlet. The soliloquy of to be or not to be is alluded to by Thomas Nash in his preface to Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophel and Stella in 1591 as being heard on the public stage, presumably the London stage, five years earlier, i.e. 1586. Nor hath my prose any skill to imitate the almond leap verse, or sit to bring five years together nothing but to be, to he, on a paper drum. The paper drum is a slang word for dramatic poetry. It appears from the above that a version of Hamlet had already been written by 1584 to 1585 and performed in some or all of the following countries, England, the Low Countries, Germany and Denmark, sometime before, during and after 1585. However, according to another source, the first version of the Shakespeare play Hamlet was written several years before in around 1580 to 1581. The secret history of the earliest version of the Shakespeare Hamlet also has a secret prehistory, one bound up in some of the greatest secrets of the Elizabethan reign. According to Bacon's word cipher, as deciphered by Dr Orville Owen, sometime in September 1576, Francis was at court in the presence of Elizabeth and her ladies and gentlemen. The court was making merry, dancing and singing and gossiping with each other, before the scene of gaiety was intruded upon by his young cousin Robert Cecil, son of Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley, and Lady Mildred Cook Cecil, elder sister of Lady Anne Cook Bacon. This mood of gaiety and fun was suddenly transformed when one of Queen Elizabeth's lady, ladies-in-waiting, Lady Scales, playfully teased and laughed at Robert Cecil, prompting him in revenge to falsely tell Elizabeth that Lady Scales had said, that thou art an arrant whore and that thou bore a son to the noble Leicester. It had the desired effect of sending Elizabeth in, into an uncontrollable rage, causing her to violently attack Lady Scales, before Francis, fearing the worst, tried to intervene, which resulted in the Queen redirecting her anger and wrath towards him. With her malicious mind still violently raging and her carcass twisting and distorting, she furiously turned to Francis and screamed at him. Slave, I am thy mother.
Before the above revelation described through his word and biliteral cipher systems, Bacon was entered at Gray's Inn on the 27th of June 1576, fully expecting to commence his studies in law, whereas the open facts of history show this did not happen. Instead, for reasons consistent with the revelation of his royal birth and all the complexities and difficulties it gave rise to, some time in the autumn it was decided by Queen Elizabeth and her secret husband Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester that Francis was to be sent to France in the train of Sir Amias Paulet. He says through his word cipher that his royal mother Queen Elizabeth wanted him out of the way. Thus was I banished, and on the day following about the hour, hour of eight, I put to sea with that gentle knight, Sir Amias Paulet, bound to the court of France. For the next two and a half years, Bacon resided in Paris and spent time in other parts of France as part of the English embassy train, following the court, studying foreign policy and sending intelligence reports in cipher back to London, to the head of the English Secret Service, Sir Francis Walsingham, his uncle Sir William Cecil and other members of the Privy Council. He was in Paris when about the 17th of February 1579, in the words of his standard biographer Spedding, that Bacon from one of those vague presentiments of evil which makes no impression upon the waking judgment but so often govern the dream. He dreamed that his father's house in the country was plastered all over with black mortar. Three days later, his beloved foster father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, died on the 20th of February, 1579. When news of his death eventually reached Francis in Paris, he left for England on the 20th of March, 1579, carrying a number of secret dispatches for Queen Elizabeth and her chief ministers and members of the Privy Council. But by then, the solemn funeral ceremony of Sir Nicholas had already taken place. To the present day, there is very little known about how Sir Nicholas really died and what exactly he died of and in precisely what circumstances. All we have is a story told by Francis later in life to his private chaplain and first editor and biographer, Dr. Rawley, which was published a hundred years after Sir Nicholas Bacon's demise by Bacon's second editor, Dr. Thomas Tennyson, afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury. Old Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon, had his barber rubbing and combing his head. Because it was very hot, the window was open to let in a fresh wind. The Lord Keeper fell asleep and awaked all distempered and in great sweat. Saith he, he to his barber, why did you let me sleep? Why, my lord, saith he, I durst not wake your lordship. Why then, saith my lord, you have killed me with kindness. So removed into his bedchamber and within a few days died. It self-evidently does not all add up, and Francis's account of Sir Nicholas's death has very quietly attracted some discreet and passing attention by the biographers of both father and son. In the still-standard 14-volume edition of The Life and Works of Francis Bacon, his great editor and biographer, James Spedin, provides a footnote as follows without any further comment. The 4th of February, 21st year of Elizabeth's reign, 1578, fell such abundance of snow. It snowed till the 8th day and freeze till the 10th, then followed a thaw with continual rain a long time after. The 20th of February, deceased Sir Nicholas Bacon, Stowe's Chronicle. In Lives of the Lord Chancellors and Lord Keepers of England, Sir Nicholas Bacon's 19th century biographer John Campbell, Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain, also referred to some of the anomalies in the account of his death, regarding which he was at a loss to explain.
He had enjoyed remarkably good health, and he might still have done the duties of his office satisfactorily for years to come, had it not happened that in the beginning of February 1579, while under the operation of having his hair and his beard trimmed, he fell asleep. The awestruck barber desisted from his task and remained silent. The contemporary accounts state that, from the sultriness of the weather, the windows of the room were open, which, considering the season of the year, I do not exactly understand. However this may be, the Lord Keeper continued long sleep in a current of air, and when he awoke he found himself chilled and very much disordered. To the question, why did you suffer me to sleep thus exposed? The answer was, I durst not disturb you. Sir Nicholas replied, by your civility I lose my life. He was immediately carried to his bed, and in a few days he expired. In the longest and most detailed account of the death and funeral of Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, found in an unpublished MA thesis for the University of Chicago, its author, Virgil Barnard, studiously describes the account by Francis of Sir Nicholas's death as a story, and also pertinently highlights the lack of information on the cause of his death. It would be appropriate to begin this account with a few words on the causes of Sir Nicholas's death, but there is little known of it. According to a story related by Francis Bacon, he fell asleep before an open window while being attended by his barber. The timid man was afraid either to wake Sir Nicholas or to close the window. When the Lord Keeper awoke, he was all distempered and in great sweat. Apparently foreseeing his demise, Sir Nicholas told the barber, you have killed me with kindness. Whatever we think of this story, he died shortly after on February the 20th, 1579, at York House, his London residence. While discussing the death of their illustrious subject in the troubled life of Francis Bacon, and the various accounts of it provided by his earliest biographers Dr Rawley, Pierre Amboise and the antiquarian John Aubrey, which are also fictional, Professors Jardine and Stewart urge us to treat them with caution. Accounts of the circumstances surrounding a prominent death in early modern England need to be taken with more than a pinch of salt. Just like the anecdote of Sir Nicholas Bacon dispensing his bon mot on the barber, who thoughtfully left open a window for fresh air, that contained the cold that killed him, this account of Bacon's end is carefully constructed. Jardine and Stewart highlight that the accounts given of Francis Bacon's death have been carefully constructed, just as the account of Sir Nicholas's death by Francis has been very carefully constructed. A story with just enough inconsistencies and hints to point to the fact that it is completely false. Thus, the traditional account of the death of Sir Nicholas Bacon must be concealing a very secret explosive truth, which could not then be uttered in public an explosive secret that has still never been openly revealed in public to the present day. What explosive truth about the circumstances surrounding the death of Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon did the carefully constructed story conceal from the Elizabethan era, including perhaps even Queen Elizabeth herself and the Elizabethan government, and from history for the last 440 years? Let us see if we can tease it out. Writing many years later, Francis recalled having a very striking dream about the death of his foster father, Sir Nicholas, and in describing it, he conjured up some very dark imagery. I myself remember that being in Paris and my father dying in London, two or three days before my father's death, I had a dream which I told to diverse English gentlemen that my father's house in the country was plastered all over with black mortar. Like his early editorial and biographical predecessors, Dr Rawley and Dr Tennyson, his standard editor and biographer, James Spedding, was privy to break in secret life and writings, something the rest of the world has still not yet woken up to. In his brief account of Bacon's dream about the death of his father, Spedding very carefully characterises it as one of those vague presentments of evil. 
appointed and ultimately revealing word to use regarding Bacon's dream about the supposed natural death of Sir Nicholas Bacon. Let us bear down on the striking phrase black mortar. The meaning of the word mortar is a mixture of lime and cement, or in other words, a mixture of compounds. Among the meanings of its cognate word mortify, from the Latin mortis meaning death, is to kill. The word black has of course many associated meanings. It is frequently associated with the sinister and the macabre. For example, black death brought about the, by bubonic plague, a poisonous and contagious disease, or the plant black nightshade or deadly nightshade, as it is otherwise known, a poisonous plant or deadly form of poison. All of this clearly suggests or points to an evil death by poisoning. If Sir Nicholas Bacon was poisoned, who of his contemporaries might wish to poison him? The most likely answer being the most notorious poisoner of the Elizabethan age, his long-time adversary, the favourite Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. The favourite Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, was the most loathed man in the kingdom, loathed by most of the nobility, his fellow privy, privy councillors and virtually all the English people. Much of his private and some of his secret life were known to members of the nobility, members of the Privy Council and the Elizabethan government, but few if any dared to talk about them publicly or out loud. This and more of the black legend of Leicester was consolidated and extended upon by an anonymous, well-placed author who knew him very well in an explosive work neutrally entitled The Copy of a Letter Written by a Master of Art of Cambridge, otherwise known as Leicester's Commonwealth that is believed to have been printed in Antwerp or Paris in 1584. Within a year, Latin and French translated versions with editions were circulating on the continent with its title very explicitly indicating its contents. A discourse on the abominable life, plots, treasons, murders, falsehoods, poisonings, lusts, incitements and evil stratagems employed by Lord Leicester. As its foreign language title indicates, the notorious tract presented a very long list of his alleged mur attempted murders, murders and other assassinations, many of them by way of poisoning, a repulsive practice for which Lester employed an Italian named Julio Borgaccini, known as Dr. Giulio. With the death of Sir Nicholas Bacon, who died in curious and suspicious circumstances, and the possible motive for it, the concealed author of Leston's Commonwealth, where it is printed in the margin, the Lord Keeper Bacon and Lord Chamberlain, Earl of Sussex, who Leicester had poisoned, explains how their deaths advantaged Leicester. Both Lord Keeper Bacon and the Earl of Sussex had from the very beginning of the Elizabethan reign closely marked Leicester's life and unspeakable transgressions, and provided its anonymous author with some of the private and secret information found in Leicester's Commonwealth. Now if we pass from court to council, we shall find Leicester no less fortified, but rather more, for albeit the providence of God hath been such that in this most honourable assembly there hath not wanted some two or three of the wisest, gravest and most experienced in our state that have seen and marked this man's perilous proceedings from the beginning, whereof notwithstanding two are now deceased, and their place is supplied to Leicester's good liking. Yet, alas, the wisdom of these worthy men hath discovered always more than their authorities were able to redress, the other's great power and violence considered. An incomplete copy of Leicester's Commonwealth is found among Francis Bacon's collection of manuscripts, otherwise known as the Northumberland Manuscript, containing letters, political tracts and dramatic devices dating from 1580 through to 1597, that originally contained copies of Bacon's two Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III, whose thrust for the crown of England, not unlike that of Leicester, involved him in schemes, plots and murdering everybody that stood in his way. 
On the outer cover of Bacon's collection of manuscripts are various words and sentences scribbled all over it, including in excess of a dozen instances of the name Bacon and Francis Bacon and the name of his pseudonym Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. Above the entry for his Shakespeare play Richard II is written by Mr Francis William Shakespeare and lower down the page the word your is twice written across his pseudonym so it reads your William Shakespeare above which is the entry for Leicester's Commonwealth. Following his return from banishment in France by his royal mother, Queen Elizabeth, and his father, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, after the reading of his foster father, Sir Nicholas Bacon's Last Will and Testament, in Trinity Term 1579, Bacon was admitted to Gray's Inn to study law. It was in his early years at Gray's Inn that, according to his word cipher, deciphered by Dr Orville Owen, he wrote the first version of his immortal play, The Tragedy of Hamlet, widely seen as the greatest drama in the Western canon. At twenty, I was to their yoke subdued. I am bound by oath on my peril not to alter my condition, and forbid to say I am the child of royalty. And, should I tell, I would be hanged. But this, like hectic in my blood, did rather exasperate than make me afraid, and I was imp importunate. My mother learned that I wrote Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, and then I was lost. Through his word cipher, Bacon tells how one night Lester discovered that he was rehearsing his company while he was supposed to be studying at Gray's Inn. My father found I had collected, whilst I was busy in the administration of law, scenes in stage plays and masks, and that I, in disguise, had trained the brethren. My noble father, one night, pried through the crevice of the garret wall where we rehearsed our play, and laughed so heartily that both his eyes were rainy. Then he, looked near, saw who did instruct each scholar for his part. Two nights together did he hear me deliver instructions to Marcellus and Bernardo on their watch, and in the dead waste and middle of the night, my father saw a figure, armed at all points, exactly cap a pie, appear and with solemn march, go slow and stately before them, my ghost, alas. My father, with an attent ear, did for a while season his bail for discontent, till I did to the gentleman give tongue. Then he presently, all inspired with rage, doth run about to my door and intercepts me, curses me a while, calls me a most unnatural fool, and roudly utters to me his complaint. An incandescent Leicester ran along and reported to Elizabeth that their son Francis played with an idle company of actors. I saw him yesternight in a most murderous play, take part, and I beseech your Royal Majesty to let him have all the rigour of the law, because this same boy is full of burning zeal to mend the time and do our country good. The amoral Leicester then implied that his own son would be better dead than living. I would that Jove esteemed him too good for earth and would raise him to a higher pomp than this. Having heard his report, Elizabeth summoned Francis to the palace, where he arrived to find her at the height of her anger as he awaited the onslaught. You personate our person, do you, among the city wits, and act your mother's death? Now, giving full force to her vicious temper, she laments not having murdered her own son at birth. Oh, by strangling you, my son, I might have had some surety in the present. You came on earth to make the earth my hell. More fury, abuse and threats of violence and death followed in the kind of language that would embarrass a fishmonger's wife, but an undaunted Francis presented a vision that would capture and mesmerise the world. I will create strange tragedies for, for mine eternal jewel. She'll speak to Hamlet of his father's foul and most unnatural murder.
royal mother was not impressed with his fertile imagination and accuses him of portraying her in Hamlet. As I fear thou hadst, thou playedst most foully to show the death of the Danish king and Hamlet to my enemies. They murdered their king in the heaviness of sleep, and the violent harm that the chiefest princes of Rome did put upon their empress, I doubt not shall be put on me. He tried to assuage her, but she was having none of it. He was a traitor, and no son of her, she ranted, shall ever be king of England. He further tried to soothe and calm her fears and suspicions by stating she had mistaken his purpose, which appeared to have the desired effect, with Elizabeth saying it all amounted to a loving and fair reply. It was, however, nothing more than a cunning pretense and ruse from a well-practised master of dissimulation. Now playing the part of a loving and mollified mother, she sent Francis off to Gray's Inn to fetch his manuscript of Hamlet. As a personal favour to my mother, I brought my cause of sorrow, the first copy of Hamlet, to the palace. When I brought it to her, the best of my matter, she, ere my hand had settled down, in passion did tear it from my bosom, and without even reading it, tore it in twain, and sans remorse, put it into the fire. These events described by Francis through his word cipher when he was 20 or in his 20th year probably took place towards the end of 1580 or in the early part of 1581 when he had already written his first version of the tragedy of Hamlet which he most likely commenced not longer after his return from France following the death of his foster father Sir Nicholas Bacon. Let us now turn our attention to the play itself. The current position of orthodox scholarship and the leading interpretations of Hamlet were succinctly summed up by Professor Anne Thompson and Neil Taylor in their Bible Arden edition of the play. Recent interpretations have, in effect, accounted for the apparently excessive focus on Gertrude by identifying her with Elizabeth I and reading the play as a kind of meditation on the ageing and passing of the Virgin Queen. Hamlet has also been seen as a, su a succession play which reflects anxieties about female intervention in patrilinear culture and represents the exhaustion of the old dynasty. More limited claims for the topicality of Hamlet are made by Karen S. Codden and Patricia Parker. Codden's essay, Such Strange Designs, Madness, Subjectivity and Treason in Hamlet and Elizabethan Culture, relates Hamlet to the decline and fall of Elizabeth's former favourite, Robert Devereux. In their 2006 and their 2016 660-page revised Arden edition of Hamlet, the first work turned to by academics and the schoolmen and students all around the world, its editors do not once refer to Francis Bacon. In fact, his name does not even make the index. This is extremely curious, not least because the play does, ex does excessively focus on Queen Gertrude, identified as Queen Elizabeth. It is a meditation on the passing of the so-called Virgin Queen and does relate to the fall of the former favourite Robert Devereux and exhaustion of the Tudor dynasty, whose relationships with Francis Bacon fills whole volumes. Their true relationships, obscured and hidden by orthodox historians, are revealed by Francis Bacon through his biliteral cipher, as deciphered by Elizabeth Wells Gallup. My name is Tidia, old way of spelling Tudor, yet men speak of me as Bacon, even those that know of my royal mother and her lawful marriage to the Earl of Leicester. I was Elizabeth's son by her wedded lord, an elder brother to Robert, the Earl of Essex, who raised a rebellion to, to obtain his own mother's kingdom, despite all other and prior rights, i.e. Francis's own hereditary rights as the eldest born and rightful heir to the throne.
In the early months of 1601, the final act in the Tudor tragedy was just beginning to play out its last throes, with its inevitable consequences of blood, death and destruction, marking the end of one of the most remarkable periods in English history, nothing less than the end of the Tudor dynasty. With the ageing Queen Elizabeth deteriorating and nearing her death, the subject of succession which had characterised the Elizabethan reign was of pressing and real concern. It was certainly preoccupying the minds of her chief ministers, the Privy Council and her government, and those of Francis Bacon and Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. Throughout her reign, the ageing Queen had lived a long double life. A public life masquerading as the so-called Virgin Queen, married to England, and a private secret life as a not-so-Virgin Queen, who had secretly married Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, with whom she had had two children, the eldest known to the world as Francis Bacon, and the other as Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex. Without informing and overlooking the prior right of his elder brother as rightful heir to the throne, the frustrated and desperate Robert Tudor Devereux, realising Elizabeth was now unlikely to recognise his elder brother Francis or himself as her Tudor heirs, decided upon seizing the reins of state by force in an ill-conceived coup d'etat. It was this lack of public acknowledgement by Queen Elizabeth of his secret royal birth, with its hereditary right to the throne, that was the true cause and impulse of his rebellion, and one which would cost him his life. On the 19th of February 1601, Essex and his principal follower, the Earl of Southampton, were arraigned at Westminster on charge of treason before the Lord Treasurer, Lord High Steward and 25 peers, 9 earls and 16 barons. The Queen had also commanded under threat of death that her other concealed royal son, Francis Tudor Bacon, appear as a prosecutor in the state trial against his royal brother, Robert Tudor Devereux. Besides her cruel and vindictive nature, the so-called Virgin Queen was most probably concerned that the state secret of her clandestine marriage to Dudley and the fact that she had given birth to two children might, in the heat of the courtroom, be spurted out by Essex, who, lest we forget, was on trial fighting for his life for attempting to seize the crown, which he thought was rightfully his. The result was a foregone conclusion, and Essex and Southampton were found guilty of high treason and sentenced to death. In those last days, while fearing for his life in the Beecham Tower in the Tower of London, where he was imprisoned before his execution, in the face of imminent death, Robert Devereux carved into the stone wall his true name over the doorway, which can still be seen to this present day, Robert Tidir, the old way of spelling Robert Tudor, conveying his status as a concealed royal prince of England. His day of reckoning came on the 25th of February, when the concealed royal prince Robert Tudor, Earl of Essex, led by the Lieutenant of the Tower and surrounded by 16 guards, walked to his execution. Taking off his hat, the concealed royal Tudor prince forgave the executioner, and after kneeling down and praying, he laid his royal head on the block and received three blows of the axe, as he brutally departed from this mortal coil. As the life of her son, Prince Robert Tudor, ebbed away, his mother, Queen Elizabeth Tudor, sat playing her virginials. In her final weeks and days, reduced to a shattered shell, wrecked with grief and guilt, without love and any more hope in the world, she cried out for Dudley and their son Essex, in the full realisation she had executed her own flesh and blood. Finally, to the relief of all those around her, her death was recorded as taking place at Richmond Palace on the 24th of March 1603. All the secrets of Elizabeth's life were known to her other royal son, Francis Tudor Bacon, whose terrible memories of his mother agitated and haunted his mind, some of which are found in the first printed quarto editions of his incomparable royal tragedy, Hamlet.
It is no coincidence that in the year Queen Elizabeth died, the first quarter edition of the Royal Tragedy of Hamlet appeared in a text amounting to 2,200 lines. During 1603, Bacon subjected the play to a thorough examination and revision, and with his royal mother now well and truly dead, a much revised and enlarged second quarter of Hamlet appeared in 1604, containing around 3,800 lines, in a play which obliquely portrays hidden in plain sight some of the most explosive secrets in all Tudor history. The tragedy of Hamlet is Francis Bacon Tudor telling his own secret and hidden story. It is partly a succession play which represents his fears and anxieties about the passing of an old ageing Queen Elizabeth and the exhaustion of a royal dynasty with Bacon having to face up to the extinction of the House of the Tudors. Through the play he discloses the unrecorded history of his own private secret life as a concealed Tudor prince and heir to the throne of England, with its players being the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. It tells the tale of its author, a disinherited royal prince, Francis Tudor Bacon, in the shape of Hamlet, asserting his royal right denied to him by his mother, Queen Elizabeth, refracted through Queen Gertrude, and her husband, the much-loathed and notorious poisoner, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, in the figure of her husband, King Claudius. In real life, Francis's noble foster father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, may have died from being poisoned by his adversary, Leicester, with a story put out he had died from a cold. And in the play, the ghost of Hamlet's father states, the whole ear of Denmark has been rankly abused, i.e. misled by the official story put out by the state, that old King Hamlet, who had died from being poisoned by Claudius, had died by accident. Elizabeth's chief minister was Bacon's nominal uncle, Sir William Cecil, husband of Lady Mildred Cook Cecil, elder sister of Bacon's foster mother, Lady Anne Cook Bacon, the model for Polonius, chief advisor to Queen Gertrude and King Claudius. With Queen Elizabeth as Gertrude and Leicester as Claudius, we can readily discern that Laertes represents Robert Tudor Devereux, which makes sense of the passage when Laertes storms Elsinore Castle with the mob crying, Laertes shall be king, the hoped for reaction of the London citizens when Essex attempted to storm the English court. Laertes shall be king, caps, hands and tongues applaud it to the clouds. Laertes shall be king, Laertes king. The first and second quartos of the tragical history of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, were being prepared, written and published through the same period by Bacon as his landmark work, The Advancement of Learning. In the year Queen Elizabeth died, the first quarto edition of Hamlet was published in 1603, followed by a much revised and enlarged edition variously dated on its title page 1604 or 1605. It appears from a letter to his cousin, Secretary of State Sir Robert Cecil, whose father, Sir William Cecil, is the model for Polonius in Hamlet, that Bacon had already conceived the design of writing the advancement sometime before the 3rd of July 1603. The first of its two books was written in 1603, with the second apparently after an interval hurriedly written in the latter part of 1604 and published in early 1605. In the advancement, Bacon set out a series of the cipher systems, which he later incorporated into his acknowledged writings and the quarto and folio editions of his Shakespeare plays. The simple cipher referred to by Bacon is a substitution cipher based upon the 24 letter Elizabethan alphabet. I and J and U and V were interchangeable, in which the letter is given a numerical value. The carefully formatted title pages of both the 1603 and 1604 quarto of the tragical history of Hamlet secretly include a number of Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. 
If we look closely at the upper section of the title pages of the 1603 edition, we see that the first five lines have been printed in three different types, block Roman, ordinary Roman and italic. This is, of course, no accident. This top section contains a total of 64 letters that when added to the three words printed in the italic, 64 plus 3 equals 67, Francis in simple cipher. It also contains 39 ordinary Roman letters, 39 F Bacon in simple cipher. The middle section has 28 words comprising of 129 letters. 28 plus 129 equals 157 for our rosy cross in simple cipher. And if the 129 letters are added to the four digits in the date, 129 plus 4 equals 133. This yields double simple cipher for Francis Bacon, 100 Bacon 33. The 35 letters in the bottom section plus the four digits in the date, 35 plus 4 equals 39 F Bacon in simple cipher. In total, the whole page contains 48 words and 228 letters and one woodcut. 48 plus 228 plus 1 equals 277, a split simple cipher for Francis Bacon 100, William Shakespeare 177. The top section of the 1604 quarto edition of Hamlet also contains a total of 64 letters that when added to the three words printed in italic, 64 plus 3 equals 67, Francis in simple cipher, and 39 ordinary Roman letters, F Bacon in simple cipher. The 16 italic letters and six Roman capital letters added to the 11 words, 16 plus 6, plus 11 equals 33, Bacon in simple cipher. The middle section has 19 words contain, containing 86 letters. 86 minus 19 equals 67, Francis in simple cipher. The 23 words and 78 ordinary letters in the bottom section, 78 plus 23 equals 101, minus one woodcut produces a total of 100, Francis Bacon in simple cipher. And conversely, 101 plus the two words in block capitals totals 103, Shakespeare in simple cipher. Furthermore, various cryptic Baconian devices are carried over to the first pages in the 1603 and 1604 quarto editions. Above the top of the first page of the 1603 quarto appears the Baconian AA headpiece, an enigmatic symbol of darkness and light where secrets are at once concealed and revealed to the initiated or to those with eyes to see. Over the top of the first page of the 1604 quarto appears another enigmatic headpiece. In the centre of the headpiece we see what appears to be a coat of arms, reminiscent of a royal coat of arms, with two figures either side of it, possibly representing Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester, looking to and reaching for something resembling a crown. To the bottom right and left, two children are depicted, possibly denoting the concealed royal heirs, Francis Tudor Bacon and Robert Tudor Devereux. The child on the left representing life and the child on the right behind whom appears to be the Grim Reaper representing death, the light and dark twin central themes of the play. It will be seen that on the first page of the 1603 edition appears the stage direction Enter Two Sentinels, and in the 1604 edition the stage direction Enter Bernardo and Francisco Two Sentinels. It will be noticed that in both instances the word Sentinels is spelt with a capital C instead of an S. The Roman numeral C represents 100, the equivalent of Francis Bacon in simple cipher, and the letter C is the third letter in the alphabet, thus two C's or a double C, 
3 and 3 placed together represents 33 Bacon in simple cipher. Furthermore, the name Hamlet is 56 in simple cipher, the same as FR Bacon, the way Bacon regularly signed his name. And the first part of the name Hamlet, i.e. Ham, is an obvious pointer and allusion to Bacon. The first scene of Hamlet is set in darkness at midnight with its associated themes of secrecy and identity. The pregnant stage direction, enter Bernardo and Francisco, two sentinels, is followed by Bernardo asking Francisco the profoundly meaningful question in the first line of the play, who's there? The name Francisco is the Spanish and Portuguese form of the masculine name Franciscus. The baptismal entry for Bacon in St. Martin's in the Fields reads Franciscus Bacon, corresponding to the English name Francis. The name of the sentinel, Francisco, Francis, set alongside the chosen name of the other sentinel, Barnardo, Barnard, Bernard in English, is doubly significant. The two names placed together as Francis Barnard possess the Christian name of Bacon and the initials of Francis Bacon. The names Francisco and Barnardo also contain an anagram of Francis Bacon. To the question then, who's there? The answer is Francis Bacon, secret concealed author of the tragical history of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. We know after addressing the question, who's there, that it is Francis Bacon hidden behind the disguises and in the names of Francisco and Bernardo. Furthermore, as if having an inner conversation with himself, Francisco instructs Bernardo to stand and unfold yourself, to which Bernardo replies to Francisco, long live the king. With the passing of his mother, Queen Elizabeth, the rightful king of England, should be her concealed son, Francis Tudor Bacon, Prince of Wales. With the kingship firmly on his mind, Francisco then says to Bernardo, you come most carefully on your hour, a time of passing from one prince to another, one reinforced by Bernardo, who identifies the hour. Tis now struck twelve, denoting not just the passing of one day to another, but the passing of one royal dynasty to another, marking the end of the Tudor dynasty. In the play, Francisco exits not to be seen again, and says as of his other self, Bernardo has my place, who is joined by both Marcellus and Horatio. The death of his beloved foster father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, which occurred shortly before Bacon wrote the first version of Hamlet, devastated him and haunted his consciousness and frames, informs and haunts the opening act of the play. The ghost of Hamlet's father, Old Hamlet, has, has on two successive nights terrified the sentinels standing guard over the royal castle at Alcinor. In the dead of the night, the sentinel Marcellus whispers, What? Has this thing appeared again tonight? With the other sentinel, Bernardo, replying, I have seen nothing. Horatio, an old friend of Prince Hamlet's, thinks they have imagined it and refuses to believe it will appear. Bernardo begins to describe their previous sightings when the ghost suddenly appears dressed in complete armour and holding a truncheon with his beaver up. All three marvel at this otherworldly apparition, with Bernardo exclaiming that it appears in the same figure of the late king. Pale and trembling, Horatio vows he would never have believed it if he had not seen it with his own eyes, before adding, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Understandably, in the play, the apparition of Hamlet's father, Old Hamlet, does not bode well for the state, and the death of Bacon's father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, the joint architect with his brother-in-law, Sir William Cecil, of the Elizabethan Reformation, did not bode well for an Elizabethan England surrounded by enemies on all sides. The ghost reappears and Horatio bids it stay illusion and attempts to make it speak. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily foreknowing may avoid, speak to me. 
The cock crows signalling the break of day, and just as it seems he might speak, the ghost disappears again. The three of them decide to tell Hamlet of what they have seen. Unto young Hamlet, for upon my life, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. The second scene opens in the royal court of Denmark, at whose helm proudly stands King Claudius, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, who believed he was king in all but name, and his wife, Queen Gertrude, Queen Elizabeth, attended by several members of the Privy Council, including Polonius, Bacon's nominal uncle, Sir William Cecil, his son, Laertes, Robert Tudor Devereux, second Earl of Essex, and daughter, Ophelia, and Prince Hamlet, Francis Tudor Bacon, Prince of Wales, all dressed in black. The newly installed king makes a speech to the court expressing his grief at the death of his brother Old Hamlet and announces that he has married his brother's widow. Laertes requests permission to return to his studies in France after showing his duty in attending the royal coronation. Claudius agrees on the proviso that Laertes has the permission of his father Polonius. Polonius, who answers, he hath, my lord, and wrung from me my slow leave by labouring petition, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. King Claudius, Bacon's father, the Earl of Leicester, then turns to Hamlet, addressing him as my son, and asks him, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? To which Hamlet replies, I am too much in the sun, an ironic and sarcastic pun on the words sun and sun. His royal mother, Queen Gertrude, asks Hamlet to stop grieving for his noble father. Thou knowest it is common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity, before unwisely asking, why seems it so particular with thee? Her insensitivity and crassness rouses the ire of Hamlet. Seems, madam, the term of address Bacon regularly used to his royal mother, Queen Elizabeth. Nay, it is, I know not seems, for they are actions that a man might play. In a telling passage where the word father is used seven times, King Claudius, the Earl of Leicester, asks Hamlet to stop grieving for his father, old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon, and think of him as a father, and again describes Hamlet as a son, as to cryptically and emphatically convey that the Earl of Leicester, dramatically reflected in the character of King Claudius, was his secret father, and Queen Elizabeth, Queen Gertrude, his secret royal mother. Horatio, Marcellus and Barnardo arrive, and echo in Bacon's dream of anticipating and seeing the death of his foster father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, and his house plastered all over with black mortar. Hamlet says to Horatio, My father, methinks I see my father. A startled Horatio asks, O oh, where, my lord? To which Hamlet replies, In my mind's eye, Horatio. Horatio tells Hamlet, I think I saw him yesternight. A confused Hamlet to ask, saw who? Horatio responds as quick as a flash, My lord, the king your father. Hamlet, the king my father? Horatio informs him that on two successive nights, Marcellus and Bernardo encountered a figure like your father, that in dreadful secrecy they imparted to me, who on a third night he had seen with his own eyes. The apparition comes, I knew your father, the ha these hands are not more like. A dumbfounded Hamlet resolves to meet with them on the battlements that night and try and speak to the apparition and swears them to secrecy. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be treble in your silence still, and whatsoever else shall hap tonight, give it an understanding but no tongue. Hamlet raises the spectre of foul play, 
but says that all deeds will rise, no matter how deeply they have been buried and revealed to men's eyes. That night on the battlements of Elsinore Castle, just as the clock struck midnight hour, Hamlet, Horatio and Marcellus await the appearance of the ghost. All of a sudden the ghost appears and in the surreal apparition before his very own eyes Hamlet recognises his father, old Hamlet, King of Denmark, who beckons to him. Despite the protestations of his companions, Hamlet follows while Marcellus senses something is rotten in the state of Denmark. The ghost declaims a pregnant injunction to Hamlet, mark me, and pointedly asks him, art thou to revenge when thou shall hear? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fasting fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away, but that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Just like in the case of Sir Nicholas Bacon, where a story was given out that he died after falling asleep in a barber shop, the ghost of old Hamlet tells Hamlet that the official story put out by the state of Denmark that he had died by accident is false. He had, he tells Hamlet, been poisoned by Claudius, the Earl of Leicester, while sleeping in his orchard. Now Hamlet here. Tis given out that, sleeping in mine orchard, a serpent stung me, so the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. But no, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. Sleeping within mine orchard, my custom always in the afternoon, upon my secure hour thy uncle stole with juice of cursed hebanon in a vial, and in the porches of mine ears did pour the leprous distilment, whose effect holds such enmity with blood of man. The ghost tells Hamlet that the incestuous Claudius seduced the seeming virtuous queen and urges Hamlet not to let the royal bed of Denmark be a couch of lust and incest and to avenge his death by killing Claudius, while insisting he must spare his mother and leave her to the judgment of God. With morning approaching, as the ghost begins to vanish into thin air, he urges Hamlet to remember him, and now, alone with himself, he swears that in his distracted globe he will remember nothing else. O oh, most pernicious woman! O oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain! His companions Horatio and Marcellus appear and breathlessly question him about what happened and what the ghost had said. At first Hamlet refused to tell them, no you'll reveal it. Horatio and Marcellus swear not to utter a word and Hamlet demands that they keep everything they have seen secret. He asks them to swear on oath to never make known what you have seen tonight, with the invisible ghost also repeating the command swear. Both Horatio and Marcellus swear never to reveal or give the slightest hint of what they have seen or heard tonight, and with all of them sworn to secrecy, Hamlet thanks them for their love and asks they never break their secret vow of silence. Oh day and night, but this is wondrous strange, and therefore as a stranger give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Rosencrantz informs Hamlet that they have commissioned a group of players, the tragedians of the city. He had previously taken delight in watching their performances, and a flourish announces the arrival of the acting troupe, with Hamlet enthusiastically greeting them like long-lost friends. With the four or five of the players before him, Hamlet thanks them for coming to Denmark, as players of the Earl of Leicester's men had, 
and asked the first player to recite a dramatic monologue recounting an episode of revenge from the Trojan War, which Hamlet begins and then is taken up by the tragedian. He delivers it with passion and emotion. His mind now turning, Hamlet asks the players for a performance of the murder of Gonzago, resembling the alleged murder of his father. Before the court, the next night, adding that he had written some dozen or sixteen lines which I would set down and insert in it. Alone, Hamlet sets forth his plan to have the players enact a killing similar to his father's murder, and if King Claudius, the Earl of Leicester, reacts like he is guilty, he will know that the ghost, Sir Nicholas Bacon, has revealed the truth of it. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. In readiness for the play within the play, Hamlet instructs and directs the players on the art of acting and narration. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you trippingly on the tongue. Do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, the whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you overstep not the modesty of nature. In his short notes for civil conversations, Bacon's advice for private conversation is the same as advice as Hamlet's to the players. It is necessary to use a steadfast countenance, not wavering with action, as in moving the head or hand too much, which showeth a fantastical light and fickle operation of the spirit, and consequently like mind as gesture, only it is sufficient with leisure to use a modest action in either. Following his fall from grace in the last few years of his life, Bacon began to revise, amend and expand a whole range of his acknowledged writings and began collecting up his Shakespeare plays for publication in the first folio. As with his known works, he subjected a large number of his Shakespeare plays to revision, adding and deleting material where he saw fit, including Hamlet. As we have seen, the first quarter edition of Hamlet comprises around 2,200 lines, with the much revised and expanded second quarter around 3,800. The first folio version of Hamlet, with about 3,900 lines, on the one hand lacks 230 lines in quarto 2, and on the other it boasts around 80 lines not in quarto 2, added by Bacon in preparation for the first folio going through the Jaggard family printing house the same Jaguar printing house that was previously responsible for printing and publishing several editions of his essays and printed another shortly after the publication of the first folio in 1624. Around the very time Bacon was revising and amending the final version of Hamlet, he wrote an astonishing letter to the Spanish ambassador Count Gondomar in June 1621, apparently unknown to or systematically suppressed by orthodox Shakespeare scholars and virtually unknown to the rest of the world, in which he explicitly states he was de to devote himself to the instruction of the actors and the service of posterity. Your Excellency's love towards me I found ever warm and sincere, alike in prosperity and adversity, for which I give you due thanks. But for myself, my age, my fortune, yea, my genius, to which I have hitherto done but scant justice, calls me now to retire from the stage of civil action and betake myself to letters and to the instruction of the actors themselves and the service of posterity. With the players prepared, Hamlet informs Horatio about the hidden purpose of the performance he has commissioned, urging him to closely observe Claudius. 
There is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I have told thee of my father's death. I prithee, when thou seest that act afoot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe my uncle. If his hidden guilt is not revealed in the one speech Hamlet had has written mirroring the circumstances of his father's murder, then the ghost has played him false, he tells Horatio. But on watching his face and actions carefully, they will combine judgments and censure his seeming. The royal couple, King Claudius and Queen Gertrude, enter at the head of a procession, followed by other members of the court, among them Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, accompanied by royal guards carrying torches. In the dumb show, the player king and queen set down the plot of the play within a play and the circumstances surrounding the death of Hamlet's father, in which asleep, in keeping with the story of Sir Nicholas Bacon's death, someone creeps in and pours poison in his ears. The player king decides to rest and falls asleep and the player queen exits. With this, Claudius turns and asks Hamlet, have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in it? Which Hamlet answers with priceless Baconian ironical wit. No, no, they do but jest, poisoning jest, no offence in the world. The usurper king Claudius asks Hamlet what is the title of the play. The mousetrap, he tells him. This play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Gonzago is the duke's name, his wife Baptista. You shall see anon. Tis a knavish piece of work, but what of that? Your Majesty, and we that have free souls, it touches us not. A mouse trap to catch a poisonous king rat, themselves usually killed by poison. Another actor playing the part of Lucianus, nephew to the player king, makes his entrance, and Hamlet whispers in his ear, Begin, murderer, pox, leave thy damnable faces and begin. Come, the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. The player Lucianus mutters darkly of evil thoughts and deeds and pours poison in the ear of the player king, just as the old Hamlet's ghost, Sir Nicholas Bacon, had described as the method of his own murder by Claudius, the Earl of Leicester. Overcome by what he has just witnessed, the evil murderous usurper Claudius, totally horror-struck, rises from his seat, and Hamlet, knowing the rat was now caught in his mousetrap, with unbridled loathing and contempt, spits out, what, frighted with false fire, Polonius demands the play is halted, and the king hurriedly leaves the room to the cry of the courtiers, bellowing for the lights. With the reaction of King Claudius, the Earl of Leicester, confirming to the eyes of Hamlet his guilt in the foul murder of the old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon, for which his ghost has repeatedly called for Hamlet to revenge. The two state spies, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, deliver to Hamlet a summons from his mother, Queen Gertrude, who demands to speak privately with him. When Polonius arrives, he too delivers the same summons from Queen Gertrude, telling him to go and speak with his mother. Feeling extremely bitter and great anger towards his mother, Hamlet declares he will be cruel, cruel but will not use violence against her. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. An alarmed and unnerved Claudius tells Rosencrantz and Guildenstern he does not feel safe to let Hamlet's madness range and instructs them to prepare themselves for a diplomatic mission. He tells them they are to accompany Hamlet to England with all due speed as he grows more dangerous by the hour. With the two state spies departed, Polonius informs Claudius that Hamlet is going to speak to his mother Gertrude in her room and that he intends to conceal himself behind the arras to secretly spy on their conversation. Alone, Claudius, the Earl of Leicester, confesses to the cruel murder of old King Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon. 
Oh, my offence is rank, it smells to heaven, it hath the primal eldest cursed upon it, a brother's murder. The evil tyrant wishes to be forgiven for my foul murder, but he does not want to give up those effects for which I did murder, my crown, my own ambition, and my queen. He ponders whether it be possible that he might be pardoned and retain the offence. In the corrupted currents of this world, offence's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft is seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But you cannot hide your crimes and sins from the all-seen eye of heaven. In Queen Gertrude's chambers, with her agreement, Polonius conceals himself behind the curtain to eavesdrop on the conversation with Hamlet. His mother, Queen Gertrude, Queen Elizabeth Tudor, tells Hamlet, Francis Tudor, that he has greatly offended his father, King Claudius, Bacon's secret biological father, the Earl of Leicester, to which Hamlet replies that it is she who has offended his real father, Old Hamlet. Their verbal exchange becomes increasingly heated and his royal mother threatens to call the guards, but Hamlet is having none of it. Come, come and sit you down. You shall not budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. Frightened that Hamlet might attack her, Queen Gertrude cries out, What will they do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help, help, ho! And on hearing it from behind the arras, Polonius also calls out for help. Angered at being spied on, Hamlet thrusts his sword through the curtain at the concealed figure, believing that he might have killed the king. But on pulling back the curtain, he discovers that he has in fact killed Polonius. His mother asks Hamlet, why does he talk to her in this way? What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? He shows her a picture depicting his real father, old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon, and his royal father, King Claudius, the Earl of Leicester, both of whose real historical identities Bacon is now just about to unmistakably reveal. Hamlet describes his father, Old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, as Jove himself, where every god did seem to set his seal. And as for King Claudius, he pointedly asks Queen Gertrude, Have you eyes? A telling allusion to Queen Elizabeth's well-known nickname for the Earl of Leicester, whom she called the two eyes of her kingdom or, as Hamlet refers to him two lines later, this Moor, the other well-known nickname for Leicester on account of his dark, gypsy-like good looks. Hamlet further expresses his disgust to Queen Gertrude, Queen Elizabeth, regarding her sexual lust and her black heart of betrayal. O oh, Hamlet, speak no more, thou turnest mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grain spots as will not leave their tinct. Shakespeare scholars have accounted for the excessive focus of Hamlet on Queen Gertrude by identifying her with Queen Elizabeth, which is much more fully illuminated when we know that Bacon is Hamlet and that Queen Elizabeth is his secret mother. As the son of Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, who was raised by Lord Keeper of the Realm, Sir Nicholas Bacon, and under the early patronage of the Chief Minister of the Elizabethan reign, Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley, Bacon knew most, if not all, the secrets of state and secrets of Queen Elizabeth's life. He knew of the murder of Leicester's first wife, Amy Robsart, and the role played in it by Elizabeth, his poisonings and her violent and murderous ruthlessness, his and her sexual lusts, their rank corruption and all other manner of his and her vices. Mother, for love of grace, lay not a flattering unction to your soul, that not your trespass but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. 
Confess yourself to heaven, repent what's past, avoid what is to come, and do not spread the compost over the weeds to make them rancour. To which a shaken and devastated Queen Elizabeth, Queen Gertrude, replies, O Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. With his words, words like daggers in the heart still ringing in her ears, Hamlet says, I must go to England, you know that. Drawing Queen Gertrude's guilty answer, tis so concluded on. Just as his royal mother and father, Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester, had agreed on exiling Bacon to France. Since the death of Polonius, his grieving daughter Ophelia has fallen into some form of madness and comes to Claudius and Gertrude speaking and singing distractedly of love, sex and death. In the meantime, her brother Laertes has in secret returned from France with his head full of suspicions about his father's death. All of a sudden, Queen Gertrude is disturbed and frightened by some kind of loud commotion. Alack, what noise is this? With a shaken King Claudius shouting for his guards. With King Claudius and Queen Gertrude fearing the worst, a messenger appears with news that Laertes, at the head of his followers, has raised a rebellion and is fast approaching the castle. Young Laertes, in a riotous head, overbears your officers. The rabble call him Lord, and, as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, the ratifiers and props of every word. They cry, Choose we, Laertes shall be king. Caps, hands and tongues applaud it to the clouds. Laertes shall be king, Laertes king. The rebellion by Laertes is a dramatised reflection of the rebellion raised by Bacon's concealed royal brother, Robert Tudor Devereux, second Earl of Essex. It makes sense of the mob crying, Laertes shall be king, an extremely unlikely prospect. The hoped-for reaction of the London populace of Essex's attempt to storm the English court in his plan to take possession of his mother, Queen Elizabeth, in his thrust for the throne, to satisfy his ambition to be king of England. His followers break down the door, and in the manner of Essex, the hothead laity storms into the room. O oh, thou vile king, give me my father, prompting the queen to intervene. Calmly, good laities. Then, in Baconian dramatic code, laities, Robert Tudor Devereux, is made to say... That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard, cries cuckold to my father, brands the harlot even here between the chaste unsmirched brow of my true mother. These lines, if read literally, are unintelligible and make no sense because they simply do not apply to laities. In the play, there is absolutely no suggestion whatsoever that he was an illegitimate child born out of wedlock to parents not married to each other. Nor is his father in any way a cuckold whose wife, of which there is no mention of any wife in the play, is having a sexual relationship with another man. On the other hand, Robert Tudor Devereux is the illegitimate royal child of Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, who though they had secretly married in private, they had never made their marriage public. Hence Robert Tudor Devereux was a royal bastard, whose true mother was no virgin queen. Laertes demands an explanation from Claudius about the circumstances surrounding the death of Polonius. The king and queen explain that Claudius is not responsible for Polonius' death, and with his suspicions allayed, Laertes begins to calm down, but says, I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Claudius tells him he shall have the truth of his father's death, but asks him that in his desire for revenge, does he actually wish to indiscriminately kill friend and foe alike? To which Laertes replies, none but his enemies, on which Claudius promises to assist Laertes in his revenge against the real culprit. 
Meanwhile, Ophelia appears distractedly singing about a funeral, with the sight of her causing Laertes to shout out in horror in seeing his sister in such a distressed state, which further compounds his desire for revenge. Two sailors arrive with letters for Horatio from Hamlet, announcing his return to Denmark. Following two days at sea, Hamlet explains he was captured by pirates who have returned him to Denmark, in which he urges Horatio, Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much haste as thou wouldst fly death. He tells Horatio, I have words to speak in thine ear will make thee dumb adding that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern continue their journey to England, as we know to their death, with Horatio imploring the sailors with all good speed to take him to Hamlet. The letters are delivered by messenger announcing Hamlet's arrival back in Denmark and asking to see Claudius the next day to explain his strange return. The king and Laertes conspire with each other to murder Hamlet in such a way as to make it look like an accident. Claudius works Laertes, asking him if he is really fixed on revenge, would he undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words, to which the easily led Laertes says he would cut his throat in the church. For the murderous poisoner Claudius, revenge should have no bounds, and rest assured Laertes will have his revenge. With murderous intent, King Claudius and Laertes conspire to arrange a fencing match between Laertes and Hamlet, in which Laertes will use a sword anointed with deadly poison, which is so mortal there is nothing on earth that will save Hamlet from death. In the midst of it, Gertrude appears with the news Ophelia has drowned herself, and Laertes collapses into tears, earmarking the series of revenge and deaths that unfold in the final act. In the grave digging scene, Hamlet and Horatio arrive not knowing that the grave diggers are in the process of digging a grave for Ophelia, and Hamlet banters with one of them. After some humorous exchanges, Hamlet sees the funeral procession headed by Claudius, Gertrude and Laertes bearing a coffin with a solemn train of courtiers following behind it, and he and Horatio conceal themselves to observe it unseen. The priest declares her death was doubtful, i.e. suicide, with Hamlet remarking to Horatio that even though they were witnessing maimed funeral rites, it must be somebody of noble rank or some estate. Laertes asks the priest, can any more be done, to which he answers, no more be done, we should profane the service of the dead. An enraged Laertes retorts that his sister will be a ministering angel when the priest is howling in hell, at which point Hamlet realises the funeral is for fair Ophelia. The distraught Laertes leaps into the grave, demanding to be buried with her, and with this Hamlet rushes forward to the surprise of the royal party. Laertes and Hamlet fight and grapple with one another as they exchange threats and insults. Claudius demands they are separated, and Hamlet says no amount of brothers combined love could match his love for Ophelia. In a highly agitated state, Hamlet departs, followed by Horatio, and in an aside, Claudius cryptically speaks to La Laertes about our last night's speech that will be put to the present push, an assurance that Laertes will get his revenge through their planned death of Hamlet. While Hamlet and Horatio discuss the need to act quickly, they are interrupted by the courtier Osric, sent to deliver the fencing challenge against Laertes to Hamlet. Despite the concerns of his loyal friend Horatio, who tells him he will lose the wager, Hamlet responds by saying that he has been in continual practice and will win at the odds. He tells Horatio, after all the deaths he has witnessed, his own mortality does not faze him, and he is prepared to die, the readiness is all, as the greatest royal tragedy in the world builds up to its final climax. The final decade of the Elizabethan reign was dominated by the Tudor trio of Queen Elizabeth and her two concealed royal princes, Francis Tudor Bacon and Robert Tudor Devereux. 
It was this shared secret that they were both royal heirs to the throne of England that initially bound these two concealed Tudor princes together, but which in the end tore them apart and resulted in the ill-conceived Essex Rebellion. An act of desperation in his reach to the throne, which involved taking possession of his mother, Queen Elizabeth, which if necessary even the possibility of murdering her in his desire to make himself King of England. With the ageing and fading Queen Elizabeth edging towards the end of her reign, the situation and frustration of their dilemma began to divide the two concealed royal princes and they began to slowly drift apart. This far into her reign, the personal and political difficulties for the so-called Virgin Queen to publicly name and recognise her two concealed sons, Francis and Robert Tudor, the fruits of her secret relationship and marriage with Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester, were even, if she had the will, simply enormous. The consequences for the succession would have almost certainly resulted in a national crisis and potential civil war. Francis had long given up any real hope of succeeding to the throne, and the thought of civil war, which was the central theme of his Shakespeare history plays portraying the War of the Roses with all its bloodshed, dividing families, fathers killing sons and sons killing fathers, was a price he would never contemplate. The man and the circumstances surrounding Essex were different, as were the means he was prepared to use to achieve his ambitions. Following his return from Ireland, Essex had become increasingly reckless and dangerous, and when Queen Elizabeth removed his monopoly on sweet wines, increasingly desperate to the point where he probably thought he had little or nothing left to lose. He was also now prepared to sacrifice and disregard the primogeniture rights of his elder brother Francis Tudor Bacon, the concealed Prince of Wales and heir to the royal throne of England. The two concealed royal princes were now pitted on opposite sides in the matter of the succession, and for Essex it was going to be nothing short of a fight to the death, one symbolically portrayed in the explosive climax to Hamlet, where Laertes, Robert Tudor Devereux and Hamlet, Francis Tudor Bacon, fight in a duel to the death. The King and Queen and Laertes, with the accompanying royal entourage, make their ceremonial entrance to the sound of trumpets and drums, carrying a table with flagons of wine on it, in a public show masking the secret conspiratorial intentions of Claudius and Laertes to kill Hamlet. And as part of the elaborate pretense, Claudius joins Hamlet and Laertes' hands. Then Hamlet, Francis Tudor Bacon, and Laertes, Robert Tudor Devereux, have an encoded conversation in the play, alluding to recent events prior to the publication of the first and second quartos of the royal tragedy. Before the trial of combat begins, which is symbolic of the state trial where Queen Elizabeth forced Bacon to act as one of the state prosecutors in the Essex trial, Hamlet, Francis Bacon Tudor, asks Laertes, Robert Devereux Tudor, to pardon him for his actions, for which he says he cannot be held responsible while under the duress of the madness that has lately afflicted him. Give me your pardon, sir, I've done you wrong, but pardon it as you are a gentleman. This presence knows, and you must needs have heard, how I am punished with sore distraction. What I have done that might your nature, honour and exception roughly awake, I here proclaim was madness. Wasn't Hamlet wronged, Laertes? Never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be taken away, and when he's not himself does wrong Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. Who does it then? His madness. If it be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wronged. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot mine arrow over the house and hurt my brother. I do receive your offered love like love and will not wrong it. I do embrace it freely, and will this brother's wager frankly play.
Now the above exchange between Hamlet, Francis Tudor Bacon and Laertes, Robert Tudor Devereux, has been framed and contextualised. We are now in a position to read and decipher it. Hamlet turns to Laertes, or Bacon to Essex, and tells him in reference to acting as state prosecutor in the greatest show trial of the Elizabethan reign, I have done you wrong, for which he asks his pardon or forgiveness. This presence knows, says Bacon Hamlet to Essex Laertes, alluding to their royal mother, Queen Elizabeth, in the guise of Queen Gertrude, how I am punished meaning the Queen has barred Bacon from her presence for continuing to defend Essex, and that others who wrongly thought he had acted against Essex had threatened his life. He says that it was not Hamlet, Bacon, that had wronged Laertes Essex. He had acted under duress and the threat of his life from their mother, who, lest we forget, sent her own son, Robert Tudor, to his death. He is of the faction that is wronged, the Bacon-Essex faction, and of two concealed royal Tudor brothers. His madness, meaning the behaviour forced upon him by his mother Queen Elizabeth, is poor Hamlet's enemy. It was not his decision or purpose to act against him, and again he, ac he asks forgiveness, that I have shot mine arrow over the house, the royal house of Tudor, and now, wait for it, hurt my brother that is, his royal brother, Prince Robert Tudor Devereux. In his reply, Laertes, Robert Tudor Devereux, assures him, I do receive your offered love like love, and will not wrong it. Trustingly, Hamlet, Francis Tudor Bacon, in hope more than expectation, accept his assurances. I do embrace it freely. And, as by way of a special notice, he again alludes to his secret concealed relationship with his royal brother, Robert Tudor Devereux, and will this brother's wager frankly play. As Hamlet and Laertes prepare to fence the poisoner and murderer King Claudius, the notorious poisoner and murderer Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, who poisoned old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon, instructs his attendants to place jars of wine on the table to toast Hamlet if he scores the first hit, and places a poisoned pearl in Hamlet's cup. Hamlet and Laertes begin to fence, and when Hamlet makes the first hit, Claudius offers him the poisoned cup of wine, but he brushes it aside and continues the match. He hits Laertes for a second time, and in her excitement, Gertrude, although the king tries to stop her, drinks from the poisoned cup and offers it to Hamlet, who declines it again. Laertes wounds Hamlet, and in a scuffle they switch rapiers, with both of them being wounded with the envenomed blade. In the mayhem, Queen Gertrude falls down, crying out, No, no, the drink, the drink, I am poisoned, and dies. A bleeding Laertes, realising he has justly brought on his death through his own treachery, reveals to Hamlet that Claudius, Leicester, is to blame for the plot to poison him. The king, the king's to blame. Grabbing the poisoned sword, Hamlet fatally stabs his tormentor Claudius and forces him to drink the remaining poison from the cup. Hear, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, follow my mother. The king dies, with Hamlet finally fulfilling his protracted quest for revenge for the death of his father, old Hamlet, Sir Nicholas Bacon. Hamlet and Laertes then forgive one another. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. A dying Hamlet pointedly exclaims out loud, Wretched Queen, adieu! A condemnation through the character of Queen Gertrude, of Francis Bacon Tudor's own mother, Queen Elizabeth, before adding, Oh, I could tell you, but let it be, which, if it were all revealed, would shock the entire world and posterity. Hamlet prevents Horatio from drinking the poison, telling him to stay alive to tell his true story. Horatio, I am dead, thou livest. 
Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Bacon knew that his appearance in the Essex trial and his part in a declaration of the practices and treasons attempted and committed by Robert Late Earl of Essex, written under the compulsion of his royal mother, would badly damage his reputation to posterity, which he pointedly alluded, alludes to in the closing scene of the play. O God, Horatio, what a wounded name, things standing thus unknown, shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Before Hamlet dies, a warlike noise is heard, and Osric explains that Fortinbras, fresh from the conquest of Poland, has fired his cannons to greet the arrival of ambassadors from England. The dying Hamlet laments that he will not live to hear the news from England, and prophesies that Fortinbras will win the election for the Danish crown, for which he has his support. The rest is silence, he says, before drawing his last breath, with his faithful friend Horatio solemnly lamenting his death. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. The soon-to-be Danish king, Fortinbras, enters with the English ambassadors and asks what has happened, and Horatio tells him that it is a tragedy of surpassing proportions. Fortinbras is overwhelmed by the sight before his eyes. This quarry cries on havoc, O proud death, what feast is toward in thine eternal cell, that thou so many princes at a shot so bloodily hast struck? The English ambassadors also lament this orgy of death and that they have arrived too late to, too late to tell the king that his commandment has been fulfilled. Rosencrantz and Gilderstern are dead. Where should we have our thanks? Horatio tells the ambassadors that even if Claudius was alive, he would not thank them as he was not the one who ordered their deaths. But since so jump upon this bloody question, you from the Polak Wars and you from England, are here arrive, give orders that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view, and let me speak to the yet unbeknowing world how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and, in this upshot, purposes mistook, fallen on the inventors' heads. All this can I truly deliver. This is not a vague commentary about the play. It is about the bloody and violent reign of Queen Elizabeth Tudor and her secret husband, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Their carnal lusts and unnatural acts, casual slaughters, poisonings and murders, of death they cunningly conspired in, including the death of his first wife, Amy Robsart, and the propaganda protecting the truth about their marital relationship and their two concealed royal princes, one which has still never been fully revealed to posterity. For a more detailed paper on Francis Bacon's authorship of Hamlet, including passages identical in thought and similar in expression, providing resemblances, correspondences and parallels from more than 30 of Bacon's writings, see sirbacon.org and francisbaconsociety.co.uk.